the United States is um, the only country um, sort of among all Western countries to have seen its maternal mortality rate rise in the last decade. Um, and it has risen significantly. Um, and there are some sort of data points that we can point to, like the one Stephanie we just talked about. Um, and I think there are other issues that don't carry as much data, one being sort of tox the toxic stress of racism and poverty um, that really shapes women's experiences. And so I think that really goes to the point that these issues are very much connected. And I think maternal mortality is one of those issues that points to, uh, you know, it's sort of like at the intersection of every other injustice that, that we see and have talked about today. Um, Noreen, I know you do a lot of work on economic security issues. I'm wondering if you could tell us what you think the most critical um, you know, rule changes are. We talked a lot about uh, rules on our last panel. What are you think the most important rule changes that we make to advance women's economic security? And I trust that you're not asking me to choose one because I have a whole, <laughs> you know, like big list here. Um, you know, I think um, I think that there are some rule changes that um, really have the power to bring bring to light a lot of issues, and I feel like fair pay is one of those. Um, I think that. Um, it's a place where we have completely stagnated in terms of progress in, in closing the gap. And by the way, I hate this whole gap language. It sounds so like, whoa, it's an accidental crack and someone's fallen through. And re meanwhile, it's, 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 it's discrimination by design in many cases. Um, so let's just get a quarter if anyone uses the word gap from now on because it just, it absolves any sort of responsibility or structural cause. Um, but I think that, um, what I feel is really compelling about fair pay is that I, obviously there's tremendous public support for women getting paid equally. For us, it brings up so many other issues impacting women's economic security, like the fact that women who, you know, women working in, not surprisingly, women-dominated, often immigrant women-dominated industries are completely exempt from certain fair pay laws like domestic workers and, and farm workers, um, that, um, or, or tipped workers at restaurants who are making $2.13 an hour. Um, it implicates the fact that women are over-segregated in low-wage jobs, make, you know, two-thirds of the minimum wage workers, which is a component of the pay gap. It implicates that, um, you know, we have pay secrecy laws in all but seven states of this country. You can't, you can, if you talk about your pay, you can be retaliated against by being fired. Um, and that's one of the, the key provisions of the Paycheck Fairness Act. Um, I think that it also really exposes the compound harm to women of color. I mean, in this country, African American women had to work up to September 1 of this year to make what to make what white men made in 2015. In my state, in California, Latina make, Latina women make 44 cents on the dollar earned by white men, and it really, really exposes in dollar and cents in a way that makes a lot of sense to a lot of people and a lot of families who depend on women about the real existence of I think sexism and racism. And so I think it's, a, I think it's a, a problem that is solvable in many ways. I think some of them are short-term and long-term solutions. So I really think that's a key component. Um, I think we really need to address the lack of work family policies in this country. Uh, women lose $28.9 billion a year um, because of lost wages, because of lack of access to childcare and paid leave. This is a, a huge issue and really what makes the United States an outlier in terms of advanced economies in the world. And I think, um, you know, I think there are other, other victories that are important to have symbolically. We mentioned the Equal Rights Amendment, and I think people struggle with whether or not that's still a relevant fight. But I will say that um, I think there's, there's a reactivation on the Equal Rights Amendment in, in an effort to make it more relevant to the issues that are I impacting young women and women of color in this country. And as long as it can do that, then it, I think it bodes well. We had an action last year where we put a petition up just kind of for kicks. And there was about 150,000 people signed the petition in a matter of a couple of days, and many of whom didn't even know that we didn't have um, an amendment in the Constitution expressly prohibiting sex discrimination. So I think that there are some wins that are very practical, that illuminate a lot of different issues that are important, that are, have popular support. And there are others that really link 
generations within the movement and that it's important for us to once and for all close the loop on. I think I would um, just add that I also think it's important for us to think about how we achieve those things, right? So thinking about different options for how we secure paid family leave, right? Is it going to be encouraging employers to give it or mm -hmm. are we going to create a you know, national legislation that's going to make it possible for everyone to get leave. Yes and yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> just because when poor women and women of color are often those left out when we leave it up to employers. To employers right.